Today I'm uh, really delighted to introduce Oliver Umberti and uh, Dr. James Cheshire, who've written this, uh, this magnificent book, uh, very beautiful and informative. Um, Oliver's a designer and, and journalist. Uh, he was a previously senior design editor at National Geographic, and Dr. Cheshire is at uh, University College London, uh, where he's a senior lecturer in quantitative human geography and uh, has a, a great interest in uh, and using uh, big data and visualization in the, in the social sciences. So uh, please welcome. Thank you. Hello, uh, and also hello to uh, the wider Google audience. Um, it brings me great pleasure to be here um, in, in a number of ways, um, especially being here in Boston, because my brother, Justin Uberti, actually worked here for uh, at least a year, I believe. Uh, he worked at the Kirkland office and then came to Boston and is now back in Kirkland. He may be watching. Uh, so, what's up, bro? <laughs> um, we're going to talk about a number of things today. We're going to be talking about data visualization. Um, we're also going to be talking about the partnership that James and I have as an academic and as a graphic designer working on equal footing um, to bring hard science uh, to the public in these uh, immersive data visualizations. And we're going to reveal how we do that, a bit of our process um, you know, on the back end, processing data, but then also uh, all the labeling and front end work that goes to making these uh, data sets um, more accessible to the public than you might find in the back of a scientific journal. But first, I want to talk a little bit about how we came to know each other. And that starts off with my work at National Geographic. Uh, as a senior design editor, um, I kind of came of age as data and big data was coming of age in the early 2000s and found myself, even though I was in the design department, eavesdropping a lot in the graphics department. I was really interested in this idea of how we take uh, data and statistics and start to visualize them. And coming from a fine arts background, I like to work with my hands a lot. And we had this data set from a story out of the EPA uh, and the study through Baylor University where they were finding pharmaceuticals, evidence of pharmaceuticals showing up in fish tissue uh, in sites all around the country. And to communicate this, I thought we got to make a fish out of pills. And not computer generated pills, not sugar pills, but the actual medications that were found in the study. So we fed up, set up a photo studio uh, in a pharmacy after hours and uh, I created this large mouth bass out of Prozac and antihistamines. Uh, the green and the yellow pills are the Prozacs, and you know, the, it was really, I had no way of knowing what really pills the pharmacy was going to have in stock, so I, I showed up with this spreadsheet of permutations of how to keep the ratios uh, in balance depending on how many pills were available. Um, and then uh, I got word of uh, a set of research uh, coming out of London. And James's PhD project was actually looking at surnames and the most popular surnames, uh, a, a huge database of, of surnames in the UK. And I was wondering if he could help me create a map of the most popular surnames in the United States. And going back and forth over a course of month, course of months, uh, we produced this map, which uh, reveals the 25 most popular surnames in each state. They're sized by frequency and colored by uh, country of origin approximately. So you get pockets of Scandinavian and German ancestry in the Midwest, uh, Spanish uh, surnames you know, rising up in the southern states, uh, pockets of French down in Louisiana, and then of course up here in Massachusetts there's some Irish uh, ancestry poking into the top 25. And to talk a little bit more about this research and what led us on to our next collaboration, bring James up. Hi everyone, thanks for having us. Um, so essentially, uh, Oliver was the first designer I'd ever met or even spoken to, I think, at this point. Um, uh, traditionally, um, you know, as in the academic sphere, don't often stick our heads out of our uh, research offices to speak to a broader audience. And I, I really enjoyed working on this particular project where we were taking kind of a large database of um, names and, and, and making them kind of uh, easily accessible and readable in this way and for someone who was just a PhD student at the time getting something in the National Geographic magazine was kind of a big big deal. 
Alongside this, I was um, working on uh, lots of maps and graphics about London. So this was, I'm not quite sure, maybe a decade ago now, um, maybe slightly less. And London was really entering a, a transition from being quite a, a data poor city to a very data rich one. So there was a lot of initiatives, particularly in the UK, but also um, over here in the States about opening up data, making data freely available uh, to the public and for others to, to use and make use of. And so this was uh, bubbling away in the background on uh, a research or a blog that I was uh, participating, uh, uh, I was contributing to making new forms of maps, that kind of thing. And it gained a lot of interest and um, a couple of publishers approached me uh, to, to turn it into a book. And it occurred to me that, you know, I'm good at making uh, maps um, that kind of are okay online and they look all right in research papers but I really needed a designer to, 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 to take these maps and put them on the printed page and the options were you, you could submit a, a, a draft manuscript to a publisher and use their in-house designer or you could work collaboratively with one as a co-author throughout and that's why I approached Oliver as a recommendation uh, or someone to recommend really in the UK um, but he'd just gone freelance at that point and said that um, you know, I think he thought I was a lot further along with the project than uh, uh, I actually was, but he agreed to, to work with me. So this was, that, that was, that, this was our first book called London, the Information Capital, and we, we uh, did a, a whole series of uh, data visualizations on that. This one is looking at um, 24 hours of uh, flights over UK um, airspace. And... Um, uh, just before we, we came out with the book, we uh, Strava data, the quantified self movement, all that kind of stuff had just started. So um, we got access to uh, uh, the, a bulk download from Strava. Um, it was still kind of a startup, a small startup at that point. Um, and we were able to map um, the flows of cyclists uh, into London across uh, the rush hour period. And so I think. You know, if we look back and we think about what the biggest kind of contribution of that book was and is, it was this, for the first time we were taking data that were being collected on apps or that were already collected and but stored behind uh, uh, firewalls and things like that. We were taking it out and we were, we were taking it to a wider audience and this was the first time people had seen this stuff um, uh, 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 about London or even any city. Um, and so that kind of got us thinking about some of the work that you know, we can do together as a collaboration and, and how we can make a contribution. And, and we've decided that you know, the things we're really interested in is kind of taking a moment in time when data are suddenly becoming available in unprecedented volumes, capturing it in, in data visualizations and then publishing it uh, as books. And it's not just about um, data visualization for its own sake. You know, we've all seen things online where there's um, you know, they kind of look cool initially and then you look back at them for a second again and you think, actually, what is that telling me? That's not telling me anything or I don't really understand that. You know, network diagrams are a classic case, you know, social networks, things like that. Um, so we're very much in the business of taking good design principles, good cartographic principles and transforming them into compelling and interesting data visualizations that can look quite traditional in many ways and you'll see that in, in some of the slides we're showing. So the, the London book was a great success. The publisher obviously wanted us to, to do a second one, and they were thinking about UK, maybe another city, something like that. But Oliver, um, through his work at National Geographic, was keen that we move spheres and actually move into the animal kingdom because he'd noticed that they were at this kind of technological moment when uh, millions or billions of, of data points are now being collected on, on small sensors. And for those, if any of you have worked with spatial data, coordinates, that kind of thing, you know, the great advantage is the, the formats, everything's exactly the same, whether it's a commuting cyclist in London in this map or some uh, commuting baboons uh, in this map. And this is a, a study where um, they had uh, GPS loggers uh, on uh, a troop of baboons or most of a troop of baboons and they were sampling them every second. So they had their location every second over a, a three week period. Um, so that's a, a lot of data points and um, you know the nice thing about it was you get these kind of uh, daily movements so you can see this is where they start sleeping and then uh, you know this is where they go out foraging and then they loop back to their sleeping site. 
that gives a, a nice kind of overall impression of their behavior. But what the researchers were really interested in is uh, how baboons make decisions and, and on where they decide to go. And so thanks to their data, thanks to the fact they had data at second by second resolution, you can zoom in to particular moments. And the moment we chose was the baboons running across this uh, area of cropland. Here they didn't like it, they got harassed by local herders and, and farmers. So it was kind of a, a, a big thing for the, for the baboons and they, to run across, they didn't want to hang around. And um, we could then see that exact moment, we could see um, uh, uh, that uh, some baboons run off one way, some, some run another way, and the fact that also that the, 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 the kind of go signal, that, that the one that they all started running on was, was led by a juvenile and their mother, not by an alpha male or female. And um, you can see how, uh, you know, at different moments in time, uh, the baboons either decide to compromise where they want to go or they choose to follow one or the other. But it's a fairly democratic decision-making process that the researchers had a hunch about but um, were only really able to prove uh, through um, a large-scale kind of data mining exercise to create these rules um, about um, when one baboon goes one way, how, how do the others follow. And this, this study really represents, I think, that, that transition from a researcher having to spend weeks in the field in a, in a, in a, a hide or a truck just monitoring uh, visually the behaviours of these animals to essentially being able to remotely follow them and, and, and things like that. And it's a transition that um, I think has probably been most profound in, in looking at marine data in particular. So this is um, up until about... I don't know, maybe 20 years ago or even less was uh, probably 20 years ago, it was probably one of the most comprehensive data sets on the distribution of whales that, that existed. And it's actually created from uh, 19th century whaling logs. So um, in this case, it was uh, because whales were a resource, you know, the city of Boston in particular was, a, uh, or the areas around here were particularly um, uh, dependent on whaling, you know, you wanted to know where the whales were and how, you, how many you've caught because it was a essentially an auditing exercise. And um, uh, a guy called Townsend went through and uh, manually mapped each of the locations, the approximate locations of where whales were killed by species. And um, you get this distribution map where you get different species of, of whale um, at different times of years appearing. And this, like a number of examples in the kind of animal kingdom is an example of where you're, you're mapping where the animals have died, essentially. Um, it's uh, the, not when they're living, but when they've been killed. Um, you're managing a resource. You're not managing a kind of environment. You're not managing an ecosystem. And um, that kind of led researchers in the 60s onwards to start developing their own uh, mini sensors to monitor animal movement and behavior. So this is one of the first uh, biologging uh, devices that was created. It was uh, developed by a guy called Rory Wilson, who's at the University of uh, Swansea. And uh, you can see here it's kind of a syringe that he's uh, pushed a, a spring in. This is a piece of cork. And on that piece of cork, he, he had a bit of um, magnesium that was, was uh, burning. Uh, when it, it came into contact with water, and they, they strapped it to the front of penguins. And when the penguin was swimming, depending on the, the speed it was going, it would push that cork in, uh, kind of up that syringe, and you, it, the magnesium would burn a, a line on it, and you'd see uh, how, how fast the, the animal was swimming. No one had done this before, and you know, even with this kind of somewhat clumsy device on the front of them, you know, he discovered that the, the birds were swimming faster than, and further than, than we thought. Jump forward to the present day, this is what Rory's lab now looks like. It's kind of a mission control for, for animal data. Here we have um, a couple of minutes of data from a, a circling vulture that they've attached a, a tag to. So you can see there's all kinds of different uh, sensors that they've crammed into this small device now, accelerometers, um, magnetometers, GPS. And so this is kind of like a, a feed of information they have about the bird's spiraling uh, behavior, looking at turbulence over the wings and that kind of thing. So we really wanted to, to kind of get to grasp 
uh, get to grips with the data and see if we can visualize it in an interesting way. How do you take that, which isn't necessarily a um, you know, uh, user-friendly uh, version of, of, of a data feed, how do, you, how do you make that into something that looks a bit like this, where you've actually just extracted a, a small sample of that data, a really interesting part of it just for a few seconds of a vulture flight, and you've uh, looked at the air temperature outside, which is one of the things that, that we're mapping here. Um, and you can really see how uh, the sensors are, are, are detecting these really tiny kind of fluctuations, perturbations in, in uh, bird behavior. And they can start looking and understanding uh, that to see how, how things are, you know, how the animal behaves and how it accounts for different things. So that's the journey, that's the journey we're on here. And, and there's some really remarkable technology. So we've got Rory's uh, uh, really high resolution uh, magnetometers, accelerometers, and things like that that he's trying to put on birds. And then we've also got tags that, um, you know, this is probably the largest tag that we've, uh, we kind of feature in the book. It's about the size of a computer mouse. Um, that thing is, is capable of collecting something like 62 gigabytes of data in a 12 hour time period. Um, about one whale. So um, in, uh, here there's a couple of little attachments where they stick suction cups, you know, same thing you'd attach a sat nav to a car window with. They creep up behind the whale uh, with this thing on a long pole and then they kind of just flick the pole down and it hits the back of the whale and uh, uh, sticks on and then after about 12 hours it will drop off and float to the surface with all this data. And they're, they're, these are kind of passive sensors. They have active ones too, but they're passive in the sense that they're using the whale's sonar to uh, detect what the whale is doing. So when whales, or toothed whales in particular, hunt, they, they emit some sonar that bounces back from uh, their environment. And uh, just as the whale is detecting the bounce back, the sensors uh, are able to detect that as well. And we have the exact moment, this is over a five second period, um, when uh, a, a, a tooth whale is, is hunting a, a very small fish. So th this is a fish that's maybe this big. And just from the sonar, it's a bit tricky to see here, but you can see that there's these signatures here. And this is stuff bouncing. This is the reflection coming back from the particular fish that he's, that he's after. So uh, each, um, the width of each of these boxes, uh, columns here is the, uh, uh, time between uh, buzzes. So the whale starts off clicking, so it will let, let off a click and wait some milliseconds before the next one comes back, a few milliseconds before the next one comes back. And it, at kind of a coarse resolution, it, it realizes there's a fish here, this is something I'm interested in. And then it zooms in a bit on the fish, and then uh, for a, a couple of seconds it then does this buzz, which is a really high resolution uh, noise, and then this is the signature, and we get every moment that the fish is um, getting closer and closer, the whale's head's here, so this is kind of distant. So you can see the fish is getting closer to the, the whale, and then um, this is at point C, this is where the fish realizes that it's possibly lunch, and it coils up and kind of springs off to try and swim away, so you get this kind of slightly more scattered uh, impression from the sonar here and then you get it swimming off uh, in this direction and then it completely disappears because um, the good news for the fish is that the fish essentially just did that uh, and as soon as the fish uh, moves to one side the whale can't see it anymore because that sonar beam is pretty it's pretty narrow field of view so the worst thing you can do if you're being chased by a whale is to try and out swim it um, you just need to, to move to one side um, and, and it loses you so we kind of have information about the, how the, the whales um, are, are feeding, about their particular ecology, but we're also using animals to um, do some ocean sensing for ourselves. So these are kind of like sen animal sentinels, if you like. And this is one of our favorite examples, really, that, that shows some of the kind of processes that we're going through. So this is a, a sensor. It's actually quite large, um, probably a, bit bigger, a little bit bigger than this. Uh, it's about this size, actually, that gets stuck to the head of a seal. And it detects information about ocean temperature, salinity, that kind of thing. 
not for ecologists, but for oceanographers who want to know what's going on uh, in the world's oceans. And there's hundreds of these seals swimming around uh, Antarctica. And this is kind of the raw feed uh, of data that comes back, or at least some uh, uh, indication of their location. And this, to me, was, the, was kind of the first graphic, raw graphic I produced, and it really captured everything we were trying to show for the book. It's one of these graphics that you think, wow, that's a big hairball of data. That's really interesting. What surprised me, really, was um, Oliver's kind of initial take on it. So um, here we have the big hairball, and I thought this would be the main kind of feature story about these particular sensors, these particular animals. I sent, I sent that previous image to, to Oliver. He then puts it in a kind of initial draft layout. This is the first you know, layout that we came up with. And you'll see that the, his instinct is just to remove all the color and all that kind of clutter and just focus on one individual track, one individual story. That's what we want to show within this big hairball. And it's a bit like this in nature documentaries. If you ever watch a nature documentary, they're not looking at a whole colony of gannets. You know, they'll zoom in on one particular breeding pair or something like that. It's because people can understand that and relate to it. And this is um, essentially what we're trying to do here. So this is a fictitious track that's just been drawn on. But we, we start looking through the hairball to find one that we, we particularly uh, thought was representative. And we settled on Rudolph who uh, is uh, an elephant seal that was tagged uh, for uh, a year or, or more, actually, I think a couple of years. Uh, and we actually track him uh, swimming along the Antarctic Peninsula, hauling out here on some sea ice, and then swimming back across towards the uh, Falkland Islands and, 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 and around there. One story that we then started thinking, well, this is really interesting, but it's a bit of a blank canvas still. We've got the journey, but what's he encountering? What kind of terrain is there? Um, what, what's, what's going on in, in the water beneath him? So we spent a lot of time working on um, terrain mapping techniques, and we'll talk briefly about this in a second, uh, that really captures you know, the ocean floor as it, as, as it is. So you can see the deep trenches he's swimming over, um, the sea ice he's encountering. And really getting to grips with that single narrative. You'll see that we have the hairball still here, but it's actually been shrunk down to quite a small part of the double page spread um, because we wanted to, to focus in on that individual. And what's more, we actually gave Rudolph two spreads in the book, which is quite a privilege. Not many animals get uh, uh, two double page spreads because actually we were interested too in the data that he was able to collect about ocean temperature. So that particular transect. Uh, is uh, strung across the page here. The black line is the depths that uh, he's diving to. Now, I thought this was a glitch on the sensor, but this line here is 1,000 meters down. So at that point, he breaks 1,000 meters underwater. And I thought that was a mistake. But actually, seals are capable of, uh, they regularly dive to those kinds of depths. Um, and that's why they're great ocean monitors, because as they're diving down, they're collecting all these measurements and you get a temperature gradient here of, of data. You can kind of see how uh, you know, we've gone from that kind of initial um, hairball, which looks a bit like this as well with the contextual data. These are kind of individual uh, uh, animal uh, types uh, to, to a much kind of cleaner impression of what's going on. Um, so really, a lot of what we do is kind of a data reduction exercise. You know, we talk about big data, but we're actually in the business of reducing as much of the data as we can to get kind of insight or intelligence, I guess. For, for, for another part of the story, it was really important to get that contextual information. So I mentioned the seafloor that we were interested in for Rudolph. But if you're um, a bird and you're flying, Actually, that doesn't make much difference. What you're interested in is the kind of medium that you're passing through, and that's, that's air. Uh, that's the wind you're encountering. So I'm sure many of you have seen um, this really excellent uh, weather visualization um, uh, called Earth.null School. Um, you know, it was one of the first visualizations kind of as a, as a cartographer that really made the cartographic community kind of sit up and think, actually, computer scientists um, kind of know what they're doing sometimes when it comes to data visualization and you know they're capable of creating these kinds of graphics so kind of inspired by that um, uh, I thought we really need to show wind global wind patterns for uh, a story we've got about albatrosses 
So um, here is uh, something I generated. Um, I'm, this is a, does anyone use R here? R stats? I did this in R, which is probably one of my proudest uh, visualizations I've ever done in, in R, um, which captured the wind conditions um, approximately during the period that we were interested in. It's model data, it's not actual. Uh, they have a few readings, but of course they have to interpolate it. But you can basically see the Antarctica. This is Antarctica and all the winds rushing off. And the reason this was so important was it, it brought to life this story about these migrating, these wandering albatrosses that go all the way around uh, Antarctica. And in particular, there's this point of no return, which is these Kerguelen Islands here. And essentially, because of the way that the winds are kind of whipping around uh, the continent, it's uh, easier for a bird to fly all the way around than to try and turn back uh, to, the, to, to the, the breeding colony. So you can see here this, this guy kind of made it and then turned back, whereas um, this one carried on all the way around because they needed the tailwinds to help them. And the researchers hadn't actually mapped the wind onto their data or their data onto the wind. So. Um, this was something that, that you know, we were quite pleased with because it really brought to life some of the, 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 the importance of the, con the context that the animals are moving through. And that's often overlooked, particularly by the researchers who are more concerned about you know, the specifics of their data. And then um, just the final example of, of context um, that, that we can now do and, um, is you know, thanks to satellite imagery and, and remotely, remotely sensed technology, you can actually map the uh, data onto the conditions that the animal was really experiencing at that time. So this is a story about snowy owls in the Great Lakes and how they um, uh, uh, spend time uh, over the winter and how, thanks to tracking technology, the researchers um, noticed that the, 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 the birds were spending a lot of time on lakes on the Great Lakes and actually discovered that they were floating on ice um, and, and hunting uh, wildfowl. And, you know, if we'd used a kind of standard satellite imagery base map for this, you know, that was probably taken in the summer or something like that, all these blue circles, which are kind of moments when the bird, a particular hour, was spent, spent time drifting on ice, would have been in, in, in water. They wouldn't have been on, on ice. So thanks to... Um, the NASA MODIS imagery, we, we were able to get, uh, again, approximate date. This is over a, a month-long period we had this data. So we selected one day in that month, and we were able to kind of line up the, the bird information with the actual um, ice information, which, um, you know, we, we're really, often people kind of overlook that, but from a kind of a, from a very detailed perspective, it's quite important for us to be able to do that. And it's really demonstrative of a transition from kind of like a data poor environment, a very data rich one that the satellites have been able to, to give us. Um, so I hand over to Oliver now to talk a bit more about some of our design process. In both of our books, uh, a theme that emerges to us uh, nearly every day when we're working two years at a time on, on, on a book is that we could have never done these books by ourselves. I couldn't have produced this book without James's ability to process huge data sets and his GIS expertise and his just general knowledge of uh, cartography and computer programming, writing custom scripts that, that produce those wind patterns. What I like to bring to the table besides the journalistic storytelling uh, perspective is the design, the typography, and a big part of helping a reader engage with these maps and pull away a story is labeling. And every, every time we make a book, we have to decide these basic principles of what does a road look like in our map? You know, how do we label a country versus a bay versus um, the actual animal's behavior and tracks? How do we create a hierarchy uh, that lets the reader zero in on what they want to know as quickly as possible? So I'm going to talk you through one example. Uh, I live in Los Angeles, and one of my favorite stories in the book. and. Uh, the story of conservation that feels most urgent to me is about P-22 and the mountain lions of Los Angeles. I live near Griffith Park. Uh, P-22 is a bit of an A-lister uh, in Hollywood right now. Um, he's got his own Twitter account. You can get t-shirts with his likeness on him. 
Um, this is an incredible photograph by Steve Winter. He shot this for National Geographic uh, using camera traps. And uh, the problem that the mountain lions in, in the Southern California region are facing is that they're effectively marooned on genetic islands by the freeways. These freeways are eight, 10 lanes long. Uh, in the Santa Monica Mountains is one population. P-22 escaped out of the Santa Monica's and got to Griffith Park where he lives by himself, but the chances of him getting back to the Santa Monica's to mate with uh, another female are slim, and even then, he's still mating within his own gene pool, so he's got a uh, uh, the, the prognosis for, for his uh, genetics is not very good. Um, down in the Santa Ana Mountains, um, you know, south of LA towards Orange County on the way to San Diego is another population of mountain lions. And in both cases, they really need an escape hatch. They need a vegetated bridge that you start to see in some other countries in Canada, Slovenia, some countries are building these forested overpasses to allow the free movement of wildlife. There's a proposal that's been green lighted to help mountain lions from P22's family up in uh, the Santa Monica Mountains get across the 101. But down in the Santa Ana's, uh, that really hasn't, that proposal hasn't taken hold. And so I really wanted to zero in on that other Santa Ana population. This is uh, about 15 years of mountain lion tracking uh, in Southern California in the Santa Ana Mountains. Um, and as we showed with the seals, if you just plot the data that comes out of the sensors, uh, it doesn't mean a whole lot. So how can we start establishing context to bring the story to life for readers? Well, one thing we want to do is we start want to lay in the terrain that the mountain lions are passing through. So we've got digital elevation models of uh, the mountain ranges along the coast. And it was important to me that this book have a, have a come together as an ensemble and just have a, a color palette and a, and a visual feel that tied all these different maps for all these different parts of the world, all these different species and technologies together. And again, coming from a fine arts background, I wanted to take these DEMs a little bit further uh, visually. And there's a technique you learn in art school called stippling. Right? If you want to render an object, the shadowed areas, you can just draw a lot of dots. And in the lighter highlighted areas, you draw fewer dots. So working together with James, a number of iterations, he wrote a custom script uh, w where he could essentially take digital elevation model, run it through this, and put lots of little dots, a lot of stippling in the dark shadowed areas of the mountain ranges and fewer dots in the lower lying flat areas. And so you end up getting an output looking like this, which we used on every uh, land-based map uh, throughout the book. And that same technique is what gives the texture to the bathymetry you saw in the seal map near Antarctica. But then uh, there's a lot of human environments that the mountain lions are interacting with. Um, and you know, we need to start identifying them. So this is me at the very beginning of the book, before we even start producing a lot of these maps, I'm coming up with a typographic palette, a, a series of three fonts that we can use interchangeably um, to, you know, how do we label the waters, how do we label the cities, a series of symbols uh, we can use to label um, mortality events or when a wolf kills an animal. And then you know, building a template, an illustrator that has a hierarchy broken out so we can easily turn on and turn off and organize all of this contextual information. And so then James starts sending me exports. Uh, this is drainage in Southern California. And most of this is all these green little streams and, and temporary uh, drainages or seasonal drainages are, are hugely irrelevant. So it's an enormous. Um, data cleaning chore to start turning this into something that doesn't make your eyes bleed. Uh, then you start throwing in the road networks. Now this is really where the story of the human environment meets the story of the animal behavior. So this is going to be what I want to highlight in my map more than uh, the drainage. And we see we've overlaid this over the stippling. And you st in our initial drafts, you start to get something like this. And I've got all of the uh, data points you saw earlier, and I just uh, grayed them back, colored them darker gray for male lions and lighter gray for female lions. And then we started talking with the researcher and thinking, can we pull out five individuals that maybe show different
behaviors. Um, for instance, the females don't have a large dispersal range. The female mountain lions tend to stay close to uh, where they were born and they continue to raise their cubs. Whereas you get mountain lions who, uh, the male mountain lions who need to disperse out for a number of reasons. One being that they will be killed or eaten by the older male mountain lions if they don't uh, strike out and find their own territory. So there's this one intrepid mountain lion, uh, M56, who leaves the Santa Anas near Camp Pendleton up here and then comes down uh, along the coast and Oceanside and cuts up uh, along the Santa Margarita River and comes over and is the only documented uh, in you know, 15 to 17 years uh, mountain lion that's crossed uh, west to east across I-15. So he gets across and you think he's home free. He's got this unbroken chain of wilderness essentially all the way down to Mexico. Uh, but he comes down here into the Hoptapool Valley, um, preys on a farmer's, a rancher's sheep. Uh, the farmer gets a, a depredation permit and uh, M56 was shot. So, uh, it's, the challenge is not just getting across, but getting across and living long enough to pass on your genes. But again, this wasn't really doing it for me. The color scheme uh, is a bit lugubrious. Uh, all this excessive um, data points in the background of the male and female lions um, is really making harder to, as a reader, connect with the individual stories. So I cleaned out all of that other data from all the other lions and just zoomed in uh, and, and used bright highlight colors to pull out the individual stories and uh, you know, you know, in the hierarchy uh, subdued everything else. Now this is an ongoing conservation issue and it's, it's a story of maybe what we did wrong, right? The, the mountain lions are uh, a signal. They tell us that maybe we've gone too far, that our freeways and our infrastructure is greater barrier than we had previously imagined. And we need to now take steps like creating vegetated bridges to kind of step backward and give the wildlife a chance to uh, live in proximity to humans. But over in Kenya, you know, where the infrastructure hasn't uh, you know, been so uh, permanently infixed on our landscape, they're taking proactive measures. It's one of the first places uh, on the planet where they're developing their infrastructure with wildlife in mind. One of the great pleasures of this book for me was to go over to Kenya and work with Save the Elephants. And they allowed me to join a uh, collaring expedition in Sabo National Park, where recently a major railway had been built from Nairobi in the center of the country to Mombasa on the coast. And this railway, high-speed railway, um, bisects Sabo National Park right through elephant migration corridors. But through Save the Elephants lobbying efforts and working with a number of local organizations, they were able to get the construction company to install these underpasses at, uh, uh, points throughout the entire railway. It's an elevator railway and they've got these uh, tunnels underneath. But what they didn't know was which of these many underpasses the elephants were most likely to use. And if they could figure out which ones they were going to use, then they could target their conservation efforts and anti-poaching efforts to those corridors. So we collared, while I was there, 10 elephants, five male, five female. Um, they wear these big, bulky um, belts around their neck with a, with a counterweight on the bottom and a GPS device on the top. So the elephants are pretty rough on these devices and they'll slam them up against things. They have to be pretty sturdy. And then uh, this is just a zoom in on a larger map that we have in the book to show what happened after 30 days of being collared. And a key theme of this book is that animals aren't these furry robots out there in the world following a Westworld type loop. You know, they make individual decisions all the time, and a couple of those individual decisions, even within a species, um, come out on this book. So after being collared, uh, there's this one you see here in red. You know, she was up, collared up here off the top of the map, and anytime you have to subdue an animal and uh, collar it, it's a little bit traumatic for the animal. They incredibly can shoot a dart from a helicopter, land, run over, take all their measurements, uh, pour water on the animal, keep its breathing airway open, uh, attach the collar, and then uh, inject a antidote that wakes the animal back up, all within about 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, I couldn't believe I was watching this right in front of me. But after those 12 minutes, uh, the animal wakes up, and Manyani here, the red line, 
she comes rushing down and goes right to the humans that she trusts here by the Kenya Wildlife Service Field Training School and for about 30 days just hung around outside the ranger school because she knew she was safe there. Uh, a couple other ones just continued doing what they do and going over to uh, some of the rivers where they like to drink. Uh, and this guy, uh, Rukinga down here, he was using, he was the first one uh, within 24 hours of being collared to use one of the underpasses and uh, make his way up here and back and down. And, um, you know, within a month, he was just crossing here on a regular basis. And here you get a sense of both sides. Uh, this is the railway berm under construction as we're flying in and Savo uh, East over here and Savo West. Um, they're planning to turn this two-lane road into a multi-lane, four, five, six-lane road. So this is going to be another barrier for the elephants to get across. But again, with proactive planning, they can build their infrastructure with wildlife in mind. This just gives you a sense of uh, how quickly they can get in there and and uh, collar the elephants, and then uh, the moment when one of them wakes up. Save the Elephants wasn't too thrilled that the, uh, some rangers spray painted a number on the side of the elephant, but I guess that makes it easier when they were doing their aerial surveys to see where uh, the ones they had collared were. But anyway, that's one of the hopeful stories in the book of using this combination of science, research, technology, ecology, and data visualization to uh, make sure that you know, humans and animals can kind of coexist uh, moving forward. Any questions? Did you often have to deal with uh, untrustworthy data? What, what do you mean by untrustworthy? Like from different uh, data sampled from different places and, and maybe you had to clean it up uh, or just that it just didn't seem like it was, it was actually reasonable. It, so it's, it's an interesting debate actually within the community um, about what you do with bad data. Um, uh, because of, you know, there's a, a bit of a trend or perceived trend in sort of academic, academic life where you have to be always reporting positive results and sometimes negative stuff's useful as well. And um, this really applies to at what stage you share your data. So are you sharing da data that um, were collected, you know, the raw data collected on the device or do you, do you share stuff that's gone through a data cleaning um, process? So we were getting data from all stages of that process. Now, if <clears throat> some stuff was completely off, like you know, GPS point was a thousand kilometers away or whatever, then then that um, you know there was a, a kind of I did a basic cleaning operation, which often was a, a standard sort of data reduction thing where you 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 run across and say, well, but this there's no way an animal went a thousand kilometers in an hour or something like that. Um, but but our uh, our approach has always been to try and show as much of the data as possible without doing too much with it. Now, there's, there's whole um, studies on, on how you interpolate between data points and all that kind of stuff, um, but we tried to stay out of that as much as possible and just showed specific, the, the kind of raw data as best we can, because if, if, if a data set's been interpolated or someone's done some modeling on it, then you've got to kind of explain that process as well to the reader, which um, we didn't want to do. So the answer is yes, there, there were messy data points, but um, fewer than I expected, actually, given the, the technologies that were involved, I think. So. Is there a dream data set or dream data sets that you haven't worked with yet that you'd really like to? We get, we get asked that question a lot. And Specific to oh, wildlife answering. or just in general on, on a, next, a future project? You're the experts. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, we have a third book in the works. To, yeah. <laughs> I just don't know how much we want to talk we about. Know, it. We, we, the, the stuff, I mean, I think that the, the dream, so, so, so specific to this, the dream that researchers are after and that they're probably a couple of years away from getting um, is interaction data. Yeah, social so, behavior. Yeah. So we've got, the example we have is from some ants that they put um, QR codes on the backs of and use high resolution 
uh, cameras to track ants in these particular colonies. Um, that was our largest data set because they were getting interactions. Um, uh, and they're planning to, to, to there's, there's a group particularly in, in, in Germany called the Max Planck um, Institute for Ornithology that are, are planning to deploy enough sensors that you get interaction both between animals and predator prey relationships and human. So as soon as you start bringing interactions in, it gets the data set explodes. And so that's something that we're not quite at that stage yet. Um, uh, but that's something I think just to get our heads around that would be cool. Um, and then I think just building on that, Oliver Olive might talk briefly, but I mean, we're getting to the point where animals are backing each other up now with yeah. their data as well. So there's a, there's a story out of uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium. We, we have a series of graphics in here on the sea otters uh, off California and how they were, they thought, they were thought to be extinct until a small population was uh, discovered uh, back in the 30s and protected and now they've rebounded and the Monterey Bay Aquarium is doing all sorts of conservation efforts and tracking to manage that population. And they're about to release, if not, if they haven't already released it this year, this um, program called OtterNet. But I really wanted to get into the book, um, but the technology just wasn't deployed yet by the time we had it published. And OtterNet is that exact thing. It's this idea of getting the social behavior and interactions between mating males and resident females and, and how as an entire population uh, they're working together. And between uh, buoys that whenever the otters pass by the buoys they offload their data to a, to a storage um, and then when the otters pass by them each other they offload their data to the sensors on each otter um, so in case anything happens to the otter uh, their data isn't lost forever. So That's really the frontier. That was awesome. Thanks for being here. Um, my question is, uh, how much do you know about the story before you start the visualization process? Or do you look at a big data set and figure out what's the right story to tell based off this? How much do you talk to the researchers beforehand? The research, this book is about animals, but it's really about the researchers who study them. I mean, they were um, so kind to sometimes welcome us into their homes um, in Ohio or in Nairobi. Uh, um, James went out in the North Atlantic with killer whale researchers. Um, they uh, worked with us start to finish. Um, we would usually do initial interviews to try and get a sense of, and maybe we'd heard about their research in a, in a scientific journal and then we reached out to them, told them what we were doing. And then we'd do initial interviews to figure out, okay, what, what, what could be cool to visualize? What are some of your favorite stories? What are some of your favorite individuals who have surprised you with unique behaviors? And then once they shared our data, we'd do initial plots, and it was always a back and forth. Okay, are we on the right track? Yes, this looks good. And then at the end, when um, coming from National Geographic, I, my habit as a designer is to, to build the visuals first, and then we write the story last to fill um, in the space that the visuals have allotted for the text. And so once we had you know, finished the layout and drafted the story, then we sent it back to them for a final review. And, Corrections. Yeah, just I think that was a slightly different, that was a difference in process. So for the London book, uh, most of that was in my head to start with in the sense that I researched the city, I knew what was going on, so I knew that these would be the stories I wanted to tell, whereas this was much more iterative. It was like, oh, you show the research that the graphic we've done, and they were like, oh, well, that's, we didn't think of it like that, or that's much more interesting, and you'd go back to the drawing board. So We have um, no illusions yeah. that we're biologists. We're not. I mean, geographer, designer, yeah. but, you know, our combined skill sets allow us to help scientists you know, share their research more widely and also in some cases we surprise them with what we were able to reveal about what their animals uh, were doing. I just want to make one more point to tack on to that is that like, that is really, you know, for you here at Google and people who work with data and have these incredible skills, um, that's the beauty of this animal tracking revolution is that you don't have to be a biologist to get involved in conservation. These scientists all over the planet uh, they, they're inundated with data. Like a week-long study could inundate them with millions of, of data points. Um, so they really need people to help, you know, crunch the data and, and, and interpret it. Um, has either of you specifically studied cartography or worked with any cartographers? Obviously National Geographic, for example, has a huge cartography department. And, uh, or is it more just kind of more general graphic design principles that you work from? So I've, I've got no formal cartographic training at all. So I did a geography degree and then a, a geography PhD, but none of it was really cartography. I think what, what's interesting, I mean, the US is kind of ahead of this 
ahead of the UK in many ways is that um, there's a transition, I think, that, 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 that card, you know, I, I teach cartography to students, but I call it data visualization um, because, you know, they get paid five times as much for it if they put that on their CV for one thing. And secondly, um, there, there's a lot more to it. I mean, it, it, there's, there's the good stuff about how you convey information to people and the standardization of things and like that visual hierarchy of labels that Oliver was talking about, I mean, that's really important. But in increasingly, you know, to make maps, you need to have this broader data science-y type background because that's where the action is. It's not where people, people aren't having to map new areas of the world, you know, for the first time. You know, the, the frontiers really are in these databases that are being extracted. So that's something I'm really, I kind of lobby for within the, the cartographic community, uh, back in the UK at least, to try and get more people with programming experience to learn a bit about cartography and not make the same mistakes, but also people who've got cartographic training to learn a bit about programming so they can uh, cut, you know, make the efficiency savings like we've been able to make in, in, in this. And absolutely, I mean, by osmosis, working at National Geographic for a decade, I was immersed in their cartographic practices, um, labeling styles. They have proprietary fonts that they use, um, but you know, there are things like, okay, you, you can use italics for physical features or uh, you know, use uh, different sizes of a sans serif for sitting labels. And a lot of that was definitely informing. Um, my thought process when I set about to build this typographic palette um, and uh, we actually hired one of my former colleagues in the cartography department to be a map editor. So after we produced 50 some maps, um, he vetted all of them and in many, many cases spotted things that I never would have picked up on my own, such as I had a road crossing the Niger River in Mali. And in fact, there's a ferry that takes you across there, not a road. So, um, all right. Well, thanks again. Okay. Very nice.